I just wanted to raise the first issue, and I guess for, for anybody, Steve, something you had brought up, yeah. but I think it's worth underlining. A lot of the lobbyists for expanded immigration, especially those from the um, you know business, the corporate side, and the libertarians say that it's possible to have a kind of immigration see welfare no approach. We let in lots and lots and lots of people, regardless of their skills and education, and somehow um, that's not going to create any cost to taxpayers. And it obviously goes beyond the health care issue, but I mean, we've tried this before in creating a kind of wall around public services. It hasn't really worked very well. I was just wondering if maybe just uh, briefly you could talk a little more about that, the experience of welfare reform. Yes, yeah, so we do have um, we do have restrictions on the new legal immigrants and illegal immigrants are not supposed to get stuff, but when you look at all the data the government collects in the current population survey or the survey of income and program participation, it's clear that a very large fraction of immigrant families do use these programs, uh, even those who are in the country illegally. And the reason is it doesn't cover all programs. There's a lot of pressure, right? As I like to say, think about the Women, Infants, and Children Nutrition Program. Just say the name and it kind of answers the question of whether we're going to keep anybody off that program. We're not. Right? But that obviously runs into the billions of dollars. So you just have to accept that. If the person's here, they're going to get it. Other things uh, that matter is states have sometimes taken a, uh, under their own initiative to provide services. Uh, as Jason mentioned, what's very common in immigrant families is for, um, for the family to receive the benefit on behalf of the U.S. born child. And that's very common just generally. That program I mentioned of uh, TANF, a very large fraction are what's called child-only households. So the family gets a check, but technically the adults in the family don't, just the children, which of course is kind of a difference without a, 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 a difference without any meaningful distinction, yeah. But nonetheless, um, that's sort of what happens. And so I think that uh, other things, of course, is that political pressure tends to move the ball back. You say, look, we're going to be tough, we're going to restrict, but then over time when no one's looking, you write regulations, and that's sort of what's happened with welfare reform as well. The regulations themselves tend to walk back a lot of the restrictions. And the reason that all happens is that a very large fraction of immigrants are low income. And so you could argue they need these services. Once here, it's very hard to prevent that from happening. And what these proposals for illegal immigrants remind us is, even people who aren't supposed to be in the country, you can still create a lot of political pressure to spend money on them because they are here. They do work. So it becomes very hard to avoid that political pressure. And again, it's a very different situation that it, uh, than existed during our last great wave of immigration 100 years ago when we didn't have a well-developed welfare state. Jason, you want to say something? Uh, your answer was so comprehensive. I, I, I was looking for an in. I, I just didn't have one. <laughs> I mean, one point I would just add to that, Steve, is that we have, for instance, the um, requirement, the federal requirement that anyone um, asking for treatment in an emergency room be cared for. Right. Um, and, uh, I mean, that's federal law. And, frankly, I'm not sure how many voters there are outside the Cato Institute or Reason Magazine who yeah, would actually sure. be willing to yeah. have people, even if they're illegal aliens, Absolutely. die on the steps of a hospital. Right. It's just not going to happen. I mean, just to reinforce your point. Yeah. Um, any uh, questions uh, for any of the panelists? Yes, sir. Oh, we have a, yeah, wait for the microphone. Uh, well, thank you so much uh, for organizing this uh, panel. Very, very interesting. Uh, I'm Alex Segura from Agencia EFE, uh, the largest newswire in Spanish. Uh, this is a question for Mr. Camarota, or maybe a uh, Greek Korean. Uh, what do you expect from the release of these uh, two studies? Do you, ex do you expect a uh, Democrat candidates to kind of change their promises regarding this issue, or at least give some more details about, you know, their health care pl plans um, and regarding immigration as well? Uh, thank you. Yeah, I just hope it informs the debate and um, maybe it would help them flesh out, help them say, look, you know, here we think this proposal, based on this research and drawing in other evidence, would cost 10 to $20 billion so the taxpayers can decide. As Chris pointed out, Something that costs $20 billion, sure, that's an enormous sum. It's bigger than the gross national product of lots of countries. But in reality, relative to what we spend on health care and other things, you could argue it's not that big. Um, and so, but you shouldn't, I, I think it's always a bad idea to have a policy proposal out there without some sense of what it's going to cost. And I hope that that's what we get out of this study. Yeah, and as far as um, 
you know, what effect it'll have, I have no idea, but part of that is up to reporters from FA and AP and the Post and the Times and et cetera to actually ask candidates. Uh, you know, there's an estimate that this is going to cost X. What's your response to that? I mean, so, so in some sense, um, it really does depend on whether people following the candidates actually confront them about this and try to get some kind of response. Any other uh, questions? Yes, sir. Wait, hold on. Wait for the microphone. Was there ever was there any consideration given to the potential economic benefit of having a healthier populace, so people are more productive and there's more economic output? How did that factor into your study? Yeah. So we focused in my analysis just on the cost of providing care. There's certainly evidence that when you give people insurance, their health care outcomes can improve. Um, and now they consume a lot more health care. People say, well, you know, if you're sick, you only wait, and then you go to the hospital, it costs a lot. But the evidence is pretty clear that that certainly happens, but on balance, people just don't, they put off the care, they do less. So um, if you give people insurance, expenditures go way up, especially for taxpayers. But it's possible maybe it would make the public, make them a little healthier, and that would be a, a positive outcome, you could argue. Remember, it's mostly a population of people between the age, ages of 18 and 45. It's a relatively young population. So, I mean, there are illegal, remember, we don't do any costs for the U.S.-born children. There are roughly 5 million minor children of illegal immigrants in the United States, but they're U.S. born. We didn't do anything with that, uh, those figures, uh, because they're all technically eligible for stuff right now. So it's possible that could be one of the, um, one of the, one of the benefits, is that folks could be a little better off, and, and they may be a little healthier for them, and they'd be more productive. But, I mean, there is a lot of, there are a lot of moving parts here. I mean, as Chris pointed out, some of these estimates might actually be low. Right. And you're, uh, you also observed that it could actually draw more people, so that there's a lot of sort of dynamic elements to it. Right. But those are, you know, it's not clear how you'd quantify or where it would end up being a net plus or a net minus, whereas these numbers are more concrete. Yeah, we do say in the study we don't deal with those secondary costs or possible other things that we don't, you know, like increased migration. Yes, sir. I'll wait for the mic. <coughs> Uh, yes, uh, Fred Lucas with uh, the Daily Signal. Um, uh, th this looks at ACA, uh, current Medicaid. Uh, did you factor in the whole Medicare for all proposal, which seems to be part of what the Democratic candidates were talking about? Uh, uh, we did not. You could probably get an idea, right? So if there are 5 million people, you have average costs here for Medicaid. You just look at the tables and figures, and you could come up with a number. So um, that number would probably be something very, very roughly like $20 billion if you said, look, we're just going to give everybody Medicaid. It's a little cheaper than the ACA right. for just the 5 million illegals. All right. And, and Medicaid for all, or Medicare for all, I mean, uh, I think it was estimated to be around $30 trillion. Uh, I mean, do, would, would you come back to saying this $10 billion to $24 billion, would that just be almost a drop in the bucket to the overall $30 trillion if that was... Well, a, that's not what we spent on a, Medicare or uh, Medicaid together. $30 trillion, you mean over how many years? Um, so this, I, is, yeah, this uh, is probably yeah. related to the estimated yeah. cost of right, Medicare right, right, for right, all right. over yeah, 10 years. Yeah, uh, 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 yeah. Okay. right, right. Estimated cost for Medicare for all. But, I mean, well, you know, a billion here, a billion there, it starts to add up. <laughs> you know, right. I mean, uh, the one, the one thing I, I would say with that is that the assumption that it would not change the amount of people coming into the country for medical care, yeah, that's when you would see like a really big change to that figure. I mean, as I mentioned, like the, the therapies that we have in this country, the, the degree of intensity of care, like the quality. I mean, if you think of like people like Arab sheikhs that go to the Cleveland Clinic, uh, if it's not just, you know, the super rich in the, around the world that are able to come to the Cleveland Clinic or MD Anderson, if it's U.S. taxpayers are paying that for everybody, yeah. all bets are off in terms of numbers if that would ever happen, which I don't mean, think it's any chance it would. But. Yes, in the back, ma'am, and then you up front. Hi, how are you guys? Emiliana with NTN24. I know you guys said roughly this could cost uh, 30 Three billion to taxpayers, but I was wondering if you factored in how much it would cost roughly uh, an average income family in their pockets. Oh, you mean so it depends so on like how much people pay. Yeah, so you could yeah. take if you went with the high range estimate again, assuming away all the secondary costs, you could take that number and divide it by the number of average uh, households in the United States, and then you could get uh, you know a figure. I can't. I've never been great at mental math, but if afterwards you can. Uh, you can, uh, we can, we can figure it out. You can divide that out. Yes, ma'am, in the front. You had to quite wait for the mic. 
Hi, Lisa Ramirez Brand. I'm with the Congressional Budget Office. We are um, curious to get a sense of what you would think on your likely enrollment adjustment. Um, would you assume, does that factor in um, the same type of enrollment rate that individuals have in programs already? Because um, we look at um, enrollment rates for, say, for example, citizen children, uh, parents who are unauthorized. Yeah. And their enrollment rate is lower um, than just the general average Medicaid right. child. So would you expect the um, illegal immigrants that would get coverage to have, in a sense, the same enrollment rate as citizen children or the same enrollment rate of the general Medicaid population? Or are, is there something about yeah. this population that you would assume it's going to be lower? Yeah. So what we assumed was that we could find a surrogate population in the American Community Survey. And then we looked at all 50 uh, states plus the District of Columbia. And we lo our surrogate population were eligible Hispanics who, um, Hispanic citizens who could enroll. And as I recall, for adults, it was about 70% for Medicaid, who seemed to have the, fit the income profile and actually enrolled. But it varied enormously by state, so we adjusted the number for each state. For children, under say, and we actually looked for children under 200% of poverty, as I recall nationally, the enrollment rate is very high, like 93%. But there aren't that many illegal immigrant children. There are lots of children of illegal immigrants, but they're U.S. born and don't count in this analysis. So that's sort of what we did to make an assumption. Now, the government estimates that a little over 80% of all legal immigrants are Hispanic. So you could argue that, well, and it looks like for the non-Hispanics, enrollment's a little bit different. So, but we just used one surrogate population and did 51 calculations by uh, age to come up with what we think is a reasonable estimate. So we would think that the enrollment rates will be pretty relatively high, but uh, much higher than the ACA estimates, but lower than they are for some other uh, relevant populations. And that, that's how we did it with the, ACE, um, with the American Community Survey. Thank you. Uh, question back there. Hi, Megan Boynton, Cronkite News at Arizona PBS. Uh, you mentioned how the public charge rule has been more enforced underneath the Trump administration. Why didn't we see the same push underneath Bush? Well, that's a great political question. Mark, you want to handle that one? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have no idea. I think some of it was uh, um, inertia. In other words, under the Clinton administration, they actually defined what welfare programs, uh, participation in which welfare programs would constitute becoming a public charge. Essentially, they said if you were on, in public housing and on Medicaid and got food stamps, you were self-sufficient. Uh, that didn't count as welfare. And my sense is that the Bush administration was really not that different. If anything, for most of its tenure, um, they were more lax on immigration even than the Clinton administration was. Only toward the end did they uh, tighten yeah. up. So I don't, I mean, I have no idea what the internal dis dynamics were, but I expect nobody even uh, thought of the issue. Nobody even brought it up under the Bush administration, which is, which really suggests, uh, again, this is a political point, but where the, where the political um, demand was for the kind of um, perspective that Trump as a candidate was offering, that the Republican and Democratic establishments basically had very similar perspectives, and so yeah. they didn't really differ that much on immigration. Uh, any other questions? You guys have any uh, final points you want to make, Chris? Um, no. no? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, uh, good. Um, I appreciate everybody's coming. Again, the hard copies are in the back if you'd like them. The Reports themselves are on our website at cis.org, as with all the rest of our work, and the video and transcript of this will be online within a few days as well. And uh, appreciate your coming and hope to see you at our next event. Thank you.